we're going to go to the first scenario, which you can read on the, uh, on the screen, I trust, um, in a class action suit against the Bank Corporation and the Securities Corporation, plaintiff's attorney, Mr. Green, in a hearing in front of Judge Dixon, but outside the presence of the jury, called the chairman of the Bank Corporation a hayseed and the other Bank Corporation directors scoundrels. Judge Jones, as a judge, how would you deal with Mr. Green? Well, let me begin by stating that notwithstanding the fact that I was born in Claremore, Oklahoma, I had to look up hayseed. <laughs> <laughs> as a result, I discovered that it referred to a hick or unsophisticated person. Well, in terms of his calling the chairman a hayseed, Mm -hmm. yep. and the board directors, scoundrels, were this in my court, I would do as follows. Mr. Green, all persons practicing before this court are expected to thoroughly familiarize themselves with the policies and procedures of the judges of this bench. Said policies and procedures are in book form and on this court's website. Now, just in case you missed it, please allow me to refer to my published policies and procedures at Appendix 1, Letter H. And I quote, Judge Jones expects counsel at all times to be civil to one another, as well as to all parties, witnesses, and court personnel, whether in front of a jury or the court. Now let's start over, Mr. Green. You can begin by apologizing to the court and to the witnesses that you previously addressed. And please keep in mind that I take it very, very seriously, for in the past, sua sponte, I have declared a mistrial when counsel misbehaved. Well, uh, Dean Broderick, uh, so many people turn to law schools, and uh, is the, uh, are, are law schools addressing the, the, the problem real? Uh, and growing a potential of I think of we're trying. Um, Judge Jones's description, I think, was apt. In New Hampshire, we would just say, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets to the same point. Uh, I think law schools are trying. I, I can speak, really, in the universe of the law school where I am. Uh, every first-year student has a course now and calls the fundamentals of law practice. And so what happens is, for 14 weeks, they take opposite sides for a criminal case. For 14 weeks, they take opposite sides of a civil case. They have mentors. They have lawyers who come in from outside. They do pleadings. They do depositions. They do arguments. They get a sense of it. Obviously, they all take courses in ethics, but some of what we're talking about falls below the radar of ethical mm. violations. Um, they take courses in legal writing, where a lot of the offending conduct takes place. Uh, we have a course called Writing for Practice, which I think will allow them to see what legal writing is about, what persuasive writing is about. We have mentors from outside the law school. Every first-year student has a lawyer mentor. They have a faculty mentor. Uh, so the efforts are made, and they also, 75% uh, of our students do externships for a semester or perhaps a year. So they're out in the real world with real lawyers. Uh, when I was in law school 100 years ago, uh, I had a course in ethics. That was all I had. And so I think law schools, mine is not unique, are doing a better job, uh, and maybe they need to, frankly, than they had been in the past. Okay. Um, Ms. Lukey, just in this, uh, after this situation, when the bank corporation officer, Ms. Schiller, was on the stand, plaintiff's attorney, Mr. Green, began to personally disparage her. Uh, the witness, Ms. Schiller, called him an ambulance chaser, and a terrible excuse for an attorney. Um, if Ms. Schiller were your witness, uh, how would you deal with her? And second, would you do anything about the plaintiff's attorney? Yes, now presumably in that instance, I'm the defense counsel for the bank and Ms. Schiller as an officer of the bank. First, I would hope that before she ever took the stand, I had taken every effort to um, convey to her particularly since we find out later that there was a little history and discovery between these two, the need to maintain uh, grace, respect, and so forth, even when he acted disrespectfully. If, however, she lost her temper and did this on the stand, 
I would ask for an immediate recess. And that recess would be to address the conduct, both of my own witness, which I would request the opportunity to do outside the hearing of the court and anybody else, while well, I reamed her, uh, and to address the court with regard to the conduct of plaintiff's attorney. Uh, the behavior of both of these individuals is unacceptable, and I actually had a case where this went on outside the courtroom in the discovery process between uh, a brilliant but eccentric CEO of a technology company, my client, and an opposing counsel, plaintiff's attorney, where they repeatedly exchanged barbs with each other to the point that my client, despite my best efforts, would do things like referring to the attorney as Mr. Bottom Dweller or Mudsucker. Oh, <laughs> While dressed in costume, my client came to every deposition. He was deposed for seven days, so I could see his frustration, but he came in costume. He came uh, dressed as Mr. Peanut. He came dressed as uh, Kermit the Frog. Uh, and I did all that I could with this until the, pla <laughs> the plaintiff's attorney filed what we called the bad behavior motion and got in front of the judge, and the judge was an incredibly senior, respectful, and just a genius of a, a judge, looked at all of this, uh, happened to be African American and someone who had studied extensively on the history of what had happened to his own uh, predecessors, looked at the two of them, and the, the best put down I had ever seen, and I was embarrassed that I had to be representing one of the two of them, said to them, if you can't show respect for a judicial system that was built on the backs of a lot of other people far nobler than you, then neither one of you deserves the privilege of being in this courtroom. Uh, silence fell. My client, dressed after that only as a college professor with patches on and a pipe, but at least nothing disrespectful, <laughs> and there were no more barbs <laughs> of that nature. It was, however, I tell the story because one of the greatest embarrassments of my own career was that I could not stop this client, and my firm would not permit me to fire the client or go off the case. Uh, I look back on it. That client is someone of whom I'm now very fond. He grew up a lot in that process, including thanks to this wonderful judge. But it is a blight on all of us as lawyers and judges when that occurs. This judge handled it very well, of course, and it is a humiliation to the attorney who can't get control over their own client. It was a number of years ago. I'm senior enough now that I would simply tell my firm, well, either he goes or I go, and you can pick. <laughs> Boy, wow. <laughs> well, assuming when these events occurred, defense counsel brought to the court's attention that during the deposition of the bank corporation's bank officer, Ms. Schiller, Mr. Green called the defense attorney stooges, a bunch of starving slobs, and underlings dressed as Mr. Peanut, uh, who graduated from 29th tier law schools. Mr. Green also disparaged the witness, Ms. Schiller, who returned fire by calling Mr. Green a shyster. This sounds uh, very true to uh, real life. Uh, Professor Mashburn. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the conduct of someone like Mr. Green fit within the cases you've researched and the subjects on which you've written so uh, authoritatively? Well, I wish I could say that it was uh, atypical or an exaggeration, and in fact, um, it's, it's neither. I've looked at hundreds of cases where behavior of someone, a litigant um, or a witness, has been labeled by the court as uncivil or unprofessional, and it runs the gamut from trying to run somebody over in the parking lot after a hearing to calling a lawyer in court, calling a witness a nut job, um, to this was, I mean, I probably several of us, of us in the room would own up to having felt this impulse, but a lawyer who screamed in the hallway after a colleague, read the case next time, moron. Um, and so the behavior, the name calling in particular, but as we know, we're skilled with the use of language, and so to say we prohibit 
vulgar or disrespectful language won't stop us in our cleverness and our ability to come up with uh, all sorts of provocative and insulting behavior. I, I will say this, one of the things that is in the hypothetical, or perhaps I read it into the hypothetical, is this, uh, the fact that, that the lawyer is not a newcomer. I, I do think there's a lot of trouble uh, with uh, especially new entrants who are not properly mentored and they don't understand what zealousness looks like. To be sure, that's one civility problem, but I would suggest we have several problems, and one of them that my research shows is absolutely driving judges crazy is the repeat offender. The lawyer who all of the judges back in chambers know about, whose behavior uh, just won't be stopped by the kind of um, more uh, soft-handed uh, techniques and getting at that lawyer and trying to figure out are you perhaps dealing with somebody who's actually got a screw loose maybe, who's got an impulse control problem or an anger management problem and are we as a profession, do we have adequate mechanisms for dealing with that? But in particular, the, the other thing to notice here is judges tend to react when lawyers call them names or accuse them of being biased, but we may be underreacting when lawyers attack witnesses. And, you know, I'd suggest that this is a real area uh, where work needs to be done because when, outs when uh, citizens look at the process, if they feel like they're going to be victimized by tactics that we as lawyers become hardened to, but uh, witnesses, for them, this can be quite traumatic and, uh, and chilling in terms of their participation in the process. Tom Wilkinson, how about your own reaction to how you'd address that problem in the deposition? Well, I, I'm not sure how offended I'd be if someone accused me of graduating from a school that was ranked 29th, but apart from that... 29th tier. 29th tier is a little different, but I might, I might re reword it. Um, but I think Professor Mashburn is absolutely correct. There are many reported cases out there presenting much more egregious uh, misconduct. I just did my own article on the 20th anniversary of our Eastern District Judge Gothrop's opinion in the Clifton versus Hall pre precision case, um, and that concerned, you know, overly coaching witnesses, uh, giving witnesses too much direction, interfering with questioning, and there's still a lot of that going on, including very recent uh, reported cases. But my checklist for the litigant and the lawyer would be to first take a break. It often diffuses uh, the situation. Don't take the bait and then, you know, and ratchet up or respond in kind. Uh, create a record, uh, remain firm, remain clear, remain calm and under control. Um, courts are really less tolerant now, it is my thesis, on bullying in depositions, on sexist language, slurs, profanity. And I think you'll find that across the board, um, that that's a, that's a helpful trend but there's still a lot of uh, misconduct of the sort that you might see in this, in this hypo. Call the court if you feel you need to, uh, but you have to be prepared to deal with a judge who will respond that this is really, you know, you're both responsible, um, you know, both of you get under control, and maybe that's still a good thing, but it may be worthwhile if you need to to call the court and involve the court. Uh, if you need to, and you, particularly if you have advance notice that this is the way your opponent operates, schedule a deposition as a videotaped deposition, because the video doesn't lie, and there are many good cases where the judge reviews the video and draws his or her own conclusions on uh, the misconduct. It's much easier to prove the misconduct and then get matters under control. I seldom pursue sanctions uh, unless the misconduct just, you know, continues to be a regular part of the depositions, uh, but sometimes you don't have any choice, and in order to uh, eliminate or reduce uh, the misconduct going forward and get the, you know, the, the later depositions under some semblance of calm, uh, maybe you need to seek uh, court intervention and, and some form of sanction to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, press the issue. 
And Judge Ash, you've, you've heard uh, your fellow panelists here. Um, what are your thoughts on what could be done to, to discourage this type of behavior on the part of uh, attorneys, of, uh, of parties, of witnesses? And uh, do judges know about repeat offenders, as uh, Professor Washburn has? A absolutely. Uh, and I guess I live from a state where a lot of people are called hayseeds. So, <laughs> Judge, if you want to come down there, we'd be more than happy to show you around. Uh, you know, trials are not, and civility is not everybody sitting around singing kumbaya. It is an advocacy uh, system, and we need to be supportive of people who are advocating positions. But personal attacks are not uh, acceptable. This case scenario, uh, I see Matt Sweeney from Nashville. There was a case, I believe, Matt, where... Uh, our courts upheld a judge finding someone in contempt for conduct at a deposition just like this. I really think a lot of the responsibility falls on the trial judge. I think he or she has got to set the tone about how things are going to be handled in his, his or her courtroom. And that's difficult because uh, sometimes lawyers don't like to be in front of judges who have pretty strict rules about how you're going to treat each other. But uh, I have found in my career uh, repeat offenders, Sometimes you have to have the courage enough to uh, report someone to the Bar Association. That's difficult to do when you see them every day, but sometimes you've got to do that. In this scenario, I think what I would do is uh, I would take both counsel, uh, say that I could find one of them in contempt, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, invite them to be my guest at the next end of court meeting so they could go find out how to be civil to each other, <laughs> and I'd pay for their dinner. But I think a lot of it is the, is the tone set by court. If you go in there not prepared, flying a little loose, uh, let people kind of say whatever they want to say, uh, then I think that creates an atmosphere of this. And a lot of clients, I know these lawyers have heard this, a lot of clients, they want a bulldog lawyer. They want somebody that's going to go embarrass the other person or rip that person's guts out. So if the lawyer says, that's not the kind of lawyer I am, I'm professional, I'd be pre I'm prepared, we're going to go in there and you're going to have a great lawyer represent you, but I'm not going to embarrass people. Uh, there's got to be some education there, but also the judge, I think, sets the tone. The, uh, the, one, one remark that was made that uh, piqued my own curiosity is that uh, your observation about Judge Judy and uh, the, the good wife uh, and law and order, and you had good things to say about the good wife. I like law and order, too. You like law and order, too. Okay. Um, could, I, could I just quickly get a, a poll of delegation uh, on uh, how, how uh, helpful, positive, or just accurate uh, these shows are? I mean, uh, start with a good wife. And, uh, I think they're entirely accurate. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't think they do us much good, to be honest. No. I think they're very harmful. Uh, I just would like to add that that I think the judge is correct. Law schools need to do more with students before they leave. They need to do more than teach them doctrine. Lawyers need a mentor when they enter the real world of law practice, and judges need to step up. And I think uh, when the judge is in control of the courtroom, everyone knows that. The most insidious part of incivility I, I saw in my time as an appellate judge was not so much the argument, but the brief writing. There's a lot of language that's crept into everyday lawyering mm -hmm. uh, that is detrimental, I think, to the profession of law. And occasionally, our, our chief justice would call lawyers on it during argument. And one day, he threatened to c conclude the argument and have a hearing right there on the allegation that had been made by one lawyer to the other. The allegation got quickly withdrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, judges have a very big role to play, and they need to play it. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I um, don't watch many. I tend to watch the British version of legal programs, so oh. I can't comment on the programs you mentioned. But I will say this. I think I, I'm a fan of televising trials. I, I believe that there is an educational component to that. But right now, we have this sort of spectator trial phenomenon that is playing out where trials are becoming entertainment and a lot of times the behavior of those lawyers is on display and without being specific I think if you have a judge who is allowing a prosecutor to yell 
at a witness um, and this isn't corrected uh, and the public is watching in huge numbers, uh, what does, now I, I know it may sound like I'm laying blame at the judge's door. I, I wouldn't want to be sitting in that seat and I know how difficult it is, but on the other hand, why isn't that behavior being stopped? That would be the question I think a, a citizen might have. And is this, if it's not being stopped, then are we televising trials that tell people this is normal behavior? I mean, recently there was a trial where the prosecutor was mocking and laughing during closing statement by opposing counsel. Um, so, so I don't. I, even outside, in in the realm, not in the realm of fiction, we have issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Judge Jones, your own th thoughts on in this area, in particular. I mean, would would televising increase civility or, or decrease it? I mean, that was, of course, with the long debate before Congress uh, went to uh, to C-SPAN debates. Right, indeed. And, um, I, you know, I have mixed mixed feelings about it, quite honestly. Um, on the one hand, I think it's good because I think that it promotes an education in civics education and promotes an education in what the judiciary is all about and how it functions. Uh, on the other side, I am concerned that there are counsel who look at it as an opportunity to have a paid uh, non-paid advertisement mm -hmm. uh, or non-paying advertisement as it was. Um, and also the opportunity to promote one's self that way, even from the bench, which I don't think is necessarily appropriate either. So I think with restrictions, it's a good thing. Mark, I'd like to comment sure, on that. Please, when please. I was president of the American College of Trial Lawyers about three years ago, Congress was debating the Sunshine in the Courtroom Act. And it was um, highly divisive, even within the board of the ACTL, because we're closely affiliated with the United States Supreme Court, they're all fellows of the college, and we didn't want to do anything that offended them. We ended up uh, with a compromise that we would support the notion that the chief of any given court should have the right to make the decision as to whether cameras are present. I, however, am a strong personal proponent of cameras being present both at the trial and appellate level because I think more often than not, it will result in um, more appropriate behavior, frankly, not just on the part of the lawyers, but on the part of the bench, the judges. And I'll just quickly recite, a friend of mine happened to be down for two different U.S. Supreme Court hearings over the last three weeks, one just to watch what was going on, and the other because she was one of the advocates on a highly public, very, very high-profile case that was being argued a week or so ago. She pointed out to me that when she was there the first time, sitting through what might be considered routine cases, she considered the conduct of the justices less than ideal. Um, a two or three of them were sitting chatting with each other very openly while the advocate was attempting to argue, uh, in other words, paying no attention to the argument being made, which was no doubt not only of great importance to the advocate and his clients, but also may have been the most important moment in his professional career. He was not a regular Supreme Court advocate. Uh, others turned their chairs around and paid no attention, and she said by the end of one of the arguments, every justice had uh, his or her back turned to the advocate and was looking the other way or pulling uh, books off the wall or whatever. By contrast, when she went the, to the hearing two or three weeks ago, though though cameras could not be there, press was waiting outside, it was a standing room only situation, you could only get in by invitation, and all of the justices who knew they were being observed by reporters from all of the major newspapers paid very close and strict attention and uh, were polite to each other, which was something that unfortunately she felt had not been the case at the first hearing. Um, I think having cameras in the courtroom would mean that the justices of whatever court and the lawyers in whatever court would behave, uh, again, in the way they'd want their mother to see watching on television. Tom Wilkinson, should your, your well, response to this. My wife and I are big fans of the uh, good wife, and I'm, I'm sure it's on later after our reception, so we'll, we'll be avidly watching that. <laughs> You get the misimpression, though, that you can take a case and then try it within a week, which is yeah, the, you know, right. the typical yeah. uh, weekly television show. I think it does present some nice ethical dilemmas mm -hmm. and some you know, topical issues. I think any 
uh, involvement of, uh, you know, presenting lawyers and judges, interacting, even if it's my cousin Vinny, is a great way for uh, the general public to learn more about the judicial system. I think trials that are um, televised is a great way to educate uh, people, but the only the problem is that the ones that tend to be televised are those that are sorted or present some bizarre or very troublesome problem. It's not the, you know, not the more run-of-the-mill cases. Of course, people may not flock to watch those run-of-the-mill cases as you know, the ones that we, ha we handle on a typical basis. Judge Ash, do you, you, you welcome cameras in your courtroom? I do. You do? Uh, I've had several trials where cameras, and most of them are, like you said, death penalty cases or high-profile murder cases. And those occasions, I've met with the attorneys before then and said, you know, guys, I got no control over this. I can't really keep them out based upon Tennessee law. And so they're going to be in there. Uh, but you're not going to react to it. And you can anticipate uh, that if you act inappropriately, uh, then I'll take a recess, get the jury out of there, and we'll deal with it. And that will be on television. And so that's a bad thing. And I do not want that to happen. Uh, I'm going to be doing my best. I know you all will be doing your best. We, we have these cans of ethics uh, that Judge Keesler taught me. And if you watch, and I know one of the judges that do the television shows, nice guy, glad he's doing that well. But, uh, uh, you know, you watch it, and they violate like six of the canons of ethics in a 30-minute episode. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Amazing the good wife, episode. which I like, that I watched the other day, the, her and her adversary were sitting there yelling at each other in front of a judge. I thought, mm -hmm. nobody allows this to happen. I think they should televise everything. I think the Supreme Court, U.S., all appellate courts should be televised. I had one guy tell me that, they, you know, the public's just not smart enough to figure this out or understand it. Ridiculous. Make them ha have it up there. And I think it would improve the behavior of, if you have judges that are acting inappropriately, uh, I was on the disciplinary board for the judiciary for a number of years. If I see stuff like that, I'm obligated under the rules to report. So we've got to get to a higher standard mm -hmm. here. And it's got, judges have got to do it, lawyers have got to do it, but we're the ones that are going to treat, or we're the ones who are going to teach clients and the public how a court system is supposed to, to operate. When I was chief in New Hampshire, we uh, installed the video cameras, so every argument was live on the web. Admittedly, we didn't have 10 million people watching every argument, but uh, you were conscious of it. It didn't change your questions, but I think it made everyone sit up a little straighter. Uh, the, 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 uh, the challenge, I think, for televising trials uh, is that you don't televise the whole trial. People don't see the whole trial. I mean, when you look at the OJ case, which was televised nationally, my guess is if you took a poll, most people would have less respect for the judicial system having watched that trial than they would have if they read about it. Uh, so I, I think it has to be controlled, and I think people need to understand what the process is. You know, it, it's not compressed into 30 minutes of... of uh, fabulous cross-examination. Trials are difficult things, and they last a long time. I think the American public would be impatient to get to the point. Uh, and so if people were to watch it with that attitude, that would not be helpful. But I do think oral arguments, including the Supreme Court of the United States, should be open and televised. Uh, we ought to know what's going on in that court and be able to assess it. Judge Jones. Yeah, um, one of the great things about the National Judicial College uh, and the curricula that's offered, uh, there are various courses being taught. I know I taught one for many years, the Handling Capital Cases course, where we had a, a separate time allocation for a judge to teach how to conduct a trial when the media is going to be there. And that judge went everywhere from A to Z in terms of establishing a written protocol. It was handed out to counsel. It was handed out to the news media. The judge had very tight reins on how things uh, were going to occur procedurally. And I think it, that's definitely the way to go if, if it's going to happen. I think that those um, highly uh, high-profile cases put tremendous stresses on every aspect of the process, and, and even people who might ordinarily not behave in those ways, I think, are under such pressure and such scrutiny that it may bring that out. But I, I want to circle back around to something that was said earlier, because I think there's a perhaps a lesson there for how to improve things. 
about 20 years ago, studies were done that showed that the incivility that was occurring during depositions, which I always tell my students, it's a little bit like Lord of the Flies. You know, the, the parents are gone and you're in this room and the <coughs> rules, I, I tell this to new students because they are often taken advantage of in those situations because they're inexperienced. And a lot of the studies showed that more experienced lawyers would pull things that they would not try on somebody who knew better, but also that a lot of, for lack of a better word, bullying was going on during those depositions that was literally cited as a reason why people were leaving the practice of law. You know, that 20 years ago when new entrants, women and minorities were coming into the profession, they'd be sent into that environment and just feel totally um, powerless and bullied by what was occurring. And I absolutely agree that the studies show that the incident rate of that has gone down. So there's something that we've done right there. And I think it may be having that on-call judge where you can hit the pause button and say, let's get the judge on the line or the ability to videotape it has made a huge difference. And I just wonder if there aren't some lessons there for how you know, to get at other forms of, of incivility because I think lawyers have gotten the message that they can't get away with it in that environment. Okay. 